Let's get start. We continue on chapter one. Last time we talked about uh, air and uh, the components of air. Let me ask you guys, what can you give me a few components of the air? Nitrogen. Nitrogen? Oxygen. Oxygen. And the, the percentage is very important because those are the main components of the air. 78 nitrogen. 71 percent nitrogen. Again, the reason percentage is important because they don't change. It's the same everywhere. I mean, almost everywhere. And what else besides 1%, that? One percent, some. One percent of some other gases, including particulate matter, carbon. No, no, no. no. What are the? I mean, we're talking about regular, like a normal okay. air. What are those? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Argon. Argon. Argon, Argon. and. Uh, one thing that's changed from place to place. Water vapor. Water vapor. Good. Those are mostly we see in what in, in normal air, right? But we know 100% clean air like that we just talked about is not attainable because both human activities and, 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 and the natural events. So we do have a few bad gases. What are they? Lead, lead, right, but I mean, it's getting very less and less that we don't even, we do concern, but not really included. If it wouldn't even study, I, I don't remember we studied lead in this chapter, because again, because of the policies that phased out lead from gasoline, so we normally don't. And also, you guys know or, or heard or not, they used to have lead in paint as well, and they phased that out too. So lead is no longer a big concern as a bad gas in the air. At least in the race, they're not anymore. What are they? Carbon monoxide. Is there a little bit of ozone? Ozone. Nitrogen oxides. Sulfur oxides. And what? NPMs. Okay, perfect it matters. So those are the bad gases we're going to talk about. And also, let's take a look at a few of these. What are they and what, why they're, 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 what the properties are they and where they're generated, etc. So first one is carbon monoxide. Okay, again, the formula is C and O, two capital letters. We'll talk more later. Uh, is produced from incomplete combustion of carbon-based fuels. Okay, carbon-based fuel we'll study more in, in, in chapter three and four are basically what you have heard, what fuel, gas, coal, natural gas. And that's not limited to those. Those are fossil fuels. But even you're burning what? Burning wood. If you don't supply enough oxygen. Again, supply enough air, right? Oxygen is from the air. Then you have a chance of these fuels complete, combust, like burn incompletely. If that's the case, you will produce what? Carbon monoxide. So these are, you can see the activities. As long as you burn something, most likely it is a carbon-based fuel. Then if you don't supply enough oxygen, you will produce carbon monoxide, okay? Carbon monoxide is called silent killer. The reason it's got a silent killer because it has no color, no taste, no smell, no odor. That means you don't even know you're in an environment of carbon monoxide until what? You're gone. You first, of course, passed out, lose conscious, and then you what? You die. Okay, you have watched movies, some, I don't know how many you guys watched the TV shows and movies. A lot of some bad guys in there kill people. They put a person in a car and then close the garage and let the car run, right? You know, that in that case, you are in an in a environment of what? Limited supply of air. And then you, your car exhaust will produce a lot of carbon monoxide. And of course, the same purpose. And the reason is, okay, the reason is carbon monoxide can kill you because on our red blood cells, there's a protein called hemoglobin. It carries oxygen and also carries carbon dioxide away from us, just let us breathe out. So that's how our blood carries oxygen and carbon dioxide, by, by that protein on our red blood cell. But carbon monoxide compete with oxygen and carbon dioxide on, our, on this protein. So that to kick oxygen out, so basically your blood is no longer to be able to, uh, to supply with the oxygen. That's why your brain, of course, your brain needs most of the oxygen, so it reacts first. You, you feel dizzy, and then you feel nausea, you, you lose conscious. Okay, that's that's why it's got a silent killer. 
Okay, these are some of the symptoms. Okay, you, your body might react to to true carbon monoxide. You can you can read more about this. Okay, so that's the first one, carbon monoxide. Second one, ozone. Okay, ozone. The formula is O3. Okay, O3, it does have a sharp odor. Okay, it can reduce lung functions and also model the leaves of cob in the crops. So you can see those are affected by ozone. Okay, affected by ozone. Those pine, pine, and needle damaged by ozone. Okay, and uh, the ozone gas odor, I don't know if you guys have experience of standing near a Xerox machine for a little longer, like a few minutes. And that weird odor is ozone. Have you guys have any experience sitting in front of Xerox machine? Let it run, of course. Right, you, 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 next time you notice that if there's a sharp odor, that's most like ozone. It's because the zero machine has laser in the, the light, and, and that activates some generation of ozone. Later on, we're gonna study that too. Okay, next is sulfur and nitrogen oxides. Okay, nitrogen oxides, they are both okay, oxides of sulfur and the nitrogen, and they both have sharp, unpleasant odor, and they both will have damaging effects on your lung tissues, okay, lung tissues. And what makes it worse is these two gases, okay, these two gases not only damage your lung tissue, they can combine with fog, mist, and even rain to produce acid rain or fog or haze, okay? And those two are from, mainly from industry, okay? You can see these are activities that generate sulfur and nitrogen oxides. Most of them are what? Industry, right? Or uh, smelting, power generation, and transportation, and industry. Of course, our daily transportation also produces these oxides. Okay, we will study acid ring as well in chapter six. And finally, the substances we have studied, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and carbon monoxide, they're pure substance. You guys remember what we're talking about? Pure substance matter is classified into what? Mixture and what? Pure substance. Those individual ones like ozone, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and, and sulfur dioxide, they're all pure substances by themselves. Okay, but particularly matter, PM is not a pure substance. Is a complex mixture. Okay, what are they? They're tiny, tiny droplets or solid particles suspended in the air. Okay, they're extremely small. Okay, that's why they can suspend, they won't, they won't settle. If they're too big, they will settle. Sometimes it will become invisible. But PMs are normally very tiny, either they're solid droplets or, or the solid particles or solid or liquid droplets. Uh, they're extremely tiny. How tiny, you can see these are comparison uh, between uh, the size of the different small objects. You can see the, some beach sand is about, about 90 micrometer. Okay, that size is micrometer. And uh, your human hair is about 50 to 70 micrometer. And these are the size of the PMs, okay, size of the PMs. You can see this is called PM10, and that's called PM2.5, you can see how small they are. You can see this. Okay, now you may wonder, what, what is PM10, what is PM2.5? Because PM is a mixture, so we don't know their composition. So when we study them, we study them well. We classify them by what? By size, right? We, we don't know what they're composed of. They're tiny droplets, and they can become anything. So we classify PMs by their size. PM10 means what? The size of PMs smaller than 10 microliter. Okay, that means seven of them aligned together, maybe the size of your hair. Okay, maybe the, I mean, sorry, the, the diameters of your hair. PM2.5 means what? Less than 2.5, maybe even what? Extremely small, okay, extremely small. So, let me ask you for a wide guess. These two PMs, which one do you think is worse? more damaging for our air or our human health. Prefer more straightforward. 2.5. Why 2.5? It, it can, I guess, if you just kind of like diffuse into... Well, what gets what? Deeper into yeah, your it works lungs. Deep. Okay, you're right. PM 2.5 is, is much, much worse than PM 10. Okay, large PMs, okay, PM 10 or even larger, sometimes can be can be absorbed or, or tracked by your what? By your nose, by your upper respiratory tract. Smaller PMs can even get deeper into your, your, your lungs and even can be absorbed into your what? Into your blood. Okay, so the smaller, smaller PMs are much, much worse than larger PMs. Okay, larger PMs. 
Okay, and this picture shows you a, 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 a satellite video uh, showing the PM 2.5. Okay, we, we can see that where PMs are located are, are, are have, have like a really big concentration of PMs are located where? North Africa, China, East China, and Middle East. Why these parts have been bigger PMs? Because what? Because of deserts, right? They're almost dead. They're almost, most of them are deserts. They don't have water and they're deserts. And deserts were the same. Sand blow wind and you can have a higher chance of generating those. East China, reason is what? First is desert, and number two is the environment gets worse and worse because of industry. And you can see also U.S. Okay, even though U.S. doesn't have that severe PM 2.5, but on the east part of the U.S., the concentration much higher than what? Than the west, or and then the middle and then the west. Why? Because east U.S. has more what? Industry. Okay, it's more industry. So, uh, because again, you hear PMs or come from what? car engines, from coal burning fires and blowing dust, etc. So there, if you have more of these blowing dust, desert, more industry, more cars, is what? You've got more PMs. Okay. And uh, sometimes, okay, we know PMs are particles. PM10, PM2.5, those are the ones that are uh, more concerned. But some PMs are even too big so that you can't even see them in your eyes. And those PMs are called soot. Okay, soot is kind of PM because there are particles they can see sustain a suspended in the air. For example, this, this is a picture of a wildfire in, in California in, in 20, 2018 August. And uh, wildfire produce a lot of PMs. And some are visible as well. As soot. Soot. So those are some brief, okay, brief introduction about these bad gases, what they are, and how they're generated. In general, we talk more throughout the semester for their generation, for their reactions. Uh, this is the website from uh, US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, they actually report the concentration of these bad gases by years, sometimes by month. They give you a trend. Hey, I want people, United US people to take a look. How, we, how we're doing changing the air quality. Are we getting it worse or making it better? They give you a trend and here, and we, they call it like a U.S. Air Annual Report. Okay, it's on this link, and you have that on your blackboard as well. So this is also the assignment for you for the chapter one discussion. Remember, we said every chapter we have a discussion. You read the report, you read an essay, no less than 250 or 200 words based on the department. Okay, so all you need is read this one. And again, you need to not only read the report and also compare the trend. How what is changing and Say something what you learned from this report. Okay, that's chapter one. Again, all you need to reply my thread okay, in that discussion. Okay, and finally, okay, finally, we talk about these bad gases are easier from what? Human activity, right? Most of the time we talk about human activity while we're talking about the bad gases, like blowing, uh, dusts, industry, uh, transportation, higher population, but we mentioned earlier, 100% air are, is not attainable, not because only because of human activity, but also what? Natural events. So these are few natural events that produce bad gases. Okay, that's something you cannot avoid because those are natural events. For example, wildfire, okay, generally naturally sometimes they produce what? PMs and carbon monoxide because wildfire burning what? Burning trees and wood. It will produce carbon monoxide and PMs. Lightning, okay, lightning, the high energy will promote the reaction of oxygen and nitrogen in the air, so lightning will produce nitrogen oxide. And because of the high energy can also produce what? Ozone. That's why I told you the Xerox machine can produce ozone, and the reason is the same, because of the light, high energy laser light produces ozone. Okay, and finally, volcano releases, there's a lot of sulfur near volcanoes, so when volcano releases that high temperature, the sulfur will be oxidized into what? sulfur oxide. So you kind of need to know these natural events that also generates these bad gases. Good? Any questions so far? Good? I told you the contents are easy, but I hope you get a deep understanding of all what we talked about. Okay, next, let's get into some chemistry. Before we study these more, we want to know more of these compounds and these substances. Okay? 
We know matters are classified into what? Pure substance and what? Uh, mixture, right? Yeah. Mixture. And we know mixture by appearance is further classified into? Homogeneous. Homogeneous and what? Heterogeneous mixture. Very good. By appearance, right? Layers or, or one uniform mix. Now, of course, in chemistry, okay, our focus is to study what? Individual substance. The pure substances. So, pure substance can also be further classified into two types. Element and what? And compound. Okay, by definition, what is an element? Element is a pure substance that cannot be chemically separated or, or decomposed. Compound is a pure substance that can be chemically what? Decomposed. Now, it's very hard to, to see, right? I mean, I, I, I won't know the reaction of every sub single substance. I wouldn't know if I give you something whether this can be chemically decomposed or not. So if there's, if there's, there's an easy way to discriminate these two types of pure substance. That is, an element is made of only one element, such as these guys, oxygen, ozone, nitrogen, argon. What's in common between these? They're made of what? Only one single what? Element. Oxygen is made of what? Oxygen. Ozone is also made of oxygen. Nitrogen is made of what? Nitrogen only. Argon is made of what? Argon. That's it. One element. That is why these pure substances cannot be what? Further decomposed. They are already one element. There's no way you can decompose it into their individual elements anymore. On the other hand, a compound is what? Is a pure substance that is made up of two or more different elements. Of course, in a fixed chemical combination. Okay, not variable. What is variable? Mixture is variable. But compound is no longer variable. It what? Fixed. For example, carbon monoxide is made of how many elements? Two. A carbon and a what? And an oxygen. Make sense? Carbon dioxide is also made by how about two elements, a carbon and what? An oxygen. But what's the difference between these two is because CNO is in one and one phase combination. In carbon dioxide, CNO is what? One and two fixed combination. See that? That's the difference. Okay, that's what we call fixed chemical combination. One single compound will have a fixed combination. If you change that, it will be a different one. And also nitrogen monoxide and sulfur dioxide, these are all compounds. Again, why? Because they have two or more different elements in a fixed combination. Does that make sense? So these two are the classification of pure substances. Again, very important, guys. I, I won't ask you to tell me the definition. I will ask and give you anything. You tell me what? What is it? What's the classification of it? Right? So let's take a quick look. Classify these as element, compound, or mixture. Let's quickly go over. This one? Compound. compound. This one? Pure. Pure, pure substance, of course, is a pure substance. What is it? Element. element. Nickel is one nickel. This one? Compound. Compound. It makes what? One, two, three, four elements. Okay, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. This one? Compound. Compound. This one? Element. element. Table salt. Compound. Table salt. Mm -hmm. Like the one you buy from grocery. Element. Compound. It's a mixture. Oh. Okay. Table salt. Most component. No, I mean the most major, major ninety, maybe ninety-five, ninety-five, ninety percent is this guy, sodium chloride. But it does have some other added salts. Okay, I'm adding salts. For example, iodine, right? You, when you buy salt, you see iodine, iodine stuff, or iodine added to it. So table salt is definitely a mixture. But sodium chloride is a what? It's a compound. Very good. Soap? Mixture. 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 Seawater? Mixture. 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 Again, guys, this is how, what I need you to know about the classification. I will never ask you definition. Okay, tell me what is, what do you think of compound? You understand the definition and 
Okay, and if we apply the classification of, of what we classify these so far to the air, it's much easier, right? In the air, what are elements? Oxygen, nitrogen, and what? Argon. These are elements, right? In the air, what are compounds? Water, what? Carbon dioxide compounds. What is the mixture? The air all together is a what? Is a homogeneous mixture. Very good. Next, okay, next. Let's have a study of the periodic table. Okay, periodic table. The periodic table is the table listing all the elements. Remember, so what is the element? Element is what? It's the pure substance, one type of pure substance. So all the elements are listed in this table form called the periodic table. Now, your book has a periodic table. If not, I can, I can actually print out a copy for you, and you can always use that. It's a tabulated form. But if you notice the periodic table, it actually has rows and what? And columns. The rows, we have a name for it called what? Periods. One row is one period. There are seven periods in the periodic table. Them rules and the groups the, the columns are called groups we have 18 groups in our periodic table 18 groups now the rules are numbered very easily one through seven no problem but the groups there are two ways of numbering okay one way is one through what through eight uh, through 18, I'm sorry. Do you see that, guys? Another way, if you take a look at the PR table, they're numbered by A and B groups. Some groups has a number followed by what? By A. Some groups are number followed by what? By B. The groups with a number followed by A are called representative groups. Okay, you can take note or write down. We'll see that more. Are called representative groups. So the elements in these groups are called the representative elements. And those elements are the one we study most in general chemistry, in fundamental chemistry. Does that make sense? And the one groups with letter B are transition metals and inner transition metals which we will study a few elements, but we won't study them in a systematic way. Does it make sense? And in this class, I will recommend you to use A and B name numbering system. So take a look, what are A groups? One, two, what? Three, four, five, six, seven, what? Eight. We have how many representative groups? Eight representative groups. Okay, we'll use that numbers more. I'll remind you again. Next. All these elements, so far, this is not complete actually, so far we actually have discovered 118 elements in seven periods. Altogether, they're all found, they're all named actually. Out of all these elements, we classify these elements into three groups, three types based on their chemical and physical property. Mostly based on their physical property, actually. Okay, later on we're gonna study they are actually different in chemical chemistry as well. So, take a look. These classified, classified elements are marked in different colors already. The one in red, I'm sorry, in green, are called metals. Most of the elements are what? Metals. And take a look, where are metals located? On this side of the periodic table. Is that right? The ones in blue are on this side of the periodic table are called what? Non-metals. Non okay, non means what? Not metals. So that means these two are totally distinct. How? Take a look. Metals are usually what? You know, you have heard of metals already, right? Metals are usually what? Shiny, solid, 
malleable and conduct what? Electricity and heat, right? Iron, aluminum, they, they are very con good conductors. So these are normally you expect from metals. Non metals means what? They, they don't have any of those. They're not always solid. They're not a shi always shiny. They could be liquid, gas, and solid, and they don't conduct electricity and heat, exactly. So that's why we call them what? Non metals. Okay, non metals. And of course, between metals and non metals, there are a few elements between them, like this line where the metal and non metals, the separation line, these elements are called the metalloids. Okay, these metalloids are basically elements sometimes has both what? Metal and non metal properties. Sometimes they're shiny, but they don't conduct electricity. Or sometimes they conduct electricity, they only conduct electricity in one way, not both ways, such as. Silicon, for example, which are very commonly used in what? In semiconductors, in your computer chips, in your cell phone chips. Okay, so these are, how do we classify based on their physical property? Or even sometimes based on our appearance. But most importantly, not only you know these terms, you know where they are what? Located. Right, you can, if I give a pair, you can shade, hey, where are the metals? Metals are here. Where are the non-metals? Non-metals what? There. We have a lot more metals than what? The non-metals and metalloids combined. Okay, we don't study a lot of metalloids. Mostly we'll focus on these two groups, metals and non-metals. Okay, next. Okay, next. Out of those 118 elements, 90 of them, around 90, say different sources tell differently, occur naturally on Earth. Okay, that means we can found naturally on Earth. The other ones are means what? They're synthesized. Okay, by a nuclear process, which we're going to study in chapter 7. More importantly, for these elements, naturally existing state, most of them are solids. A few are gases. A few, how many? Eight are gases. We'll see that. What are those eight that are gas elements? And only two are liquids. Okay, so that means, guys, I need you to memorize those. Okay, you don't have to know all these solids because most of them are what? Solids. All you need to memorize is what? Two liquids and the eight what? Gases. Because that's how they exist in nature. What state do they exist in nature? Again, two liquids are bromine and what? And mercury first. So let's take a look where they are. Where is bromine? Here, the liquid, you see that? The orange line. Liquid, here's bromine, which is a what? Non metal or metal? Non metal, very good. Bromine is the only non metal liquid. This is what? Mercury, which is what? Metal, metal. means those the only what? Liquid metal. That is the only, you only know the, the typical one. The other ones, are, of course, are what? Are, are non metal, are solids. Okay, these are the liquids one. And the, 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 sorry, the pink ones are gases, okay? Gases are hydrogen, oxygen, I'm sorry, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, and this whole group, we call those noble gases. What is the group? Do you guys remember? What's the group number called? 8A. 8A group. Very good. Or 18 if you can say that's fine. Okay. 8A is a group called noble gas. You know they're called noble gas means what? They're all what? Gas. Argon is one of them. Okay, this is argon. Okay, 18 is argon. So noble gas plus what? Plus hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and what? and chlorine. These are gases. Okay, these are gases. Okay, so uh, after you memorize these liquid and gas, you know the rest of them are all what? Solids. Okay, solids. Okay, next. We know elements. In our periodic table, you already see that. They're listed not by their names, but by what? By their symbols. Okay, by their symbols. And that's how we use to tell people 
or to write, to, to represent these elements using their what? Symbols, instead of what? Instead of the names. So what is our symbol for an element? A symbol for an element is usually a letter or two letter combination. But keep in mind, if it is only one letter, it has to be capitalized. If it's a two letter combination, you have to capitalize the first one and lowercase the what? The second one. That's, that's not a rule, that's just common sense for chemistry. Okay, there's no single element with two capital letters, that means there are two, two, two elements. If you use two capital letters, there's what? Two elements. Because one single letter is an element. A single followed by a lower is also what? Element. Okay, so that's how we do symbol. And the symbols are from their names. Most times are from their names. But the name doesn't have to be English. Okay, it doesn't have to be English. Some are from Latin or some other languages. Okay, also some are from the name of the country where it was discovered, or some are from the name of the country where the scientist who discovered was born. Okay, they're mostly what? They're mostly names. What's their names? Places are still names. Names of people, names of places, names of the country. And these are give you few examples of the, the name in, in Latin language, in Greek. Okay, mercury, copper, uh, lead, gold, iron. They're actually names from other language. But we, of course, we have names from English as well. What? N, nitrogen, right? O, oxygen. C, carbon, etc. A, H, hydrogen. Okay, but not limited to English names. Okay? Uh, I think I, well, I will remind me, I will post a document that you, I forgot if I have done that already. I post the document consist come with a periodic table and the second page was name and, and, uh, and symbol like listed in the tablet form together for you. So you can print it on and always use it. Okay, but again, you need to get yourself used to and know the names of the element if, I, if you see a symbol. So you don't have to go use your periodic table all the time when you take a test or do the quizzes. Okay, and of course, in the lecture, we'll see a lot of symbols. And you, sometimes you don't really need a, like a, like a read a book, read a PR table, like that's boring, right? It's how you, you get well, better and when, you, when, you, when you study the lectures. Okay, next. No matter elements or compounds, okay, compounds, or even mixtures, the smallest building block of these substances, of these matters, is called an atom. Chemistry is built on atoms. The whole planet Earth is actually built by what? By individual atoms. Okay, individual atoms. Okay, atoms are the smallest building block for chemistry. And we'll see that many times. That means during chemistry, atoms themselves, what? They don't change. Okay, the identity of the atoms, we should say better, they change in chemistry. But the identity of the atoms will never change if we're still talking about chemistry. If the chemistry identity changed, then it's no longer chemistry. We call those physics. We call them nuclear process. Okay, so that's first, atoms are the smallest beauty blocks. And atoms, of course, because they're beauty blocks, they what? They make what? They make monocles, they make compounds. So they chemically combine together in a certain way. Okay, in a certain ratio, in a certain spatial arrangement, they make what? They make monocles. Okay, for example, let's do two. Oxygen atoms, two bind together to give what? Oxygen. Three combine together to give what? Ozone. Okay, later on, we're going to even study with their structures. Okay, why, why they combine differently. Okay, carbon and oxygen in a 1 1 ratio give carbon monoxide. In a 1 2 2 ratio, give you what? Carbon dioxide. And of course, the same. Okay, water is water is hydrogen and oxygen 2 to 1. If hydrogen and oxygen 2 to 2, you get hydrogen peroxide. You can actually buy it from what? From drugstores, hydrogen peroxide. Move this one a little bit. Ready? 
And finally, sulfur and, and oxygen give you sulfur oxide, sulfur dioxide, and sulfur trioxide. So this is uh, first atoms. Now, after okay, after you study, you know the smallest building block is atom. Okay, small. We have an even better definition for element and compound. Okay, before we do that, let me ask you, what is an element? Pure substance. substance pure substance? They cannot so, be chemically decomposed. Cannot be decomposed. And in another word, is composed of only what? One element, right? Compound is a pure substance composed of what? Two or more what? Elements. Now think about element is made by what? Atoms, right? A small building of an atom. So we could say element is made of only one kind of what? Atoms. Right? They're made of atoms. One element means what? One kind of atom. The one type. Because what? You've got only one element. One element is one type of atom. Well, compounds are made of by what? Two or more types of what? Atoms. Does it make sense? Okay, the atoms are the small building blocks. If you have one element, that means the type of atom ha can only be what? One type. If you have two elements, then you need what? Two or more types of atoms. Does it make sense? So that's, I think, is a better definition of elements, uh, sorry, elements versus compound. For example, let's not look at this. Let's look at these. These are all what? Compounds. Is that right? Water, carbon monoxide, carbon sulfur dioxide. Why? Because they got two types of what? Elements. Two types of what? Atoms. Okay, you got sulfur atom, you got oxygen atom, right? You got hydrogen atom, you got what? Oxygen. So they got two types of atoms. Then that's why they're compounds. These two, they go in have what? One type of atom. What is it? Oxygen atom. No matter two oxygen or three oxygen, the type is only what? One. That is why there are elements. Does it make sense? So with that, let's take a quick look at these, these pictures. Even though we don't tell these what they are, what they are actually are, but we can classify them into what? Element. Element. Compound. Compound. Mixture. And mixture. See that? Because you know what? You know the type. This guy has two types. I don't know what they are, but there are two types. These are only what? One type. Even there are two of them, but I know I only care about type. If we classify elements in compound. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay, now, since we know that elements is the one that contains only one type of atoms, but Elements do exist in different ways. Some element exist as one single atom matter. That means, or I shouldn't end that. Some elements they exist as single atom matter. Some elements exist as two atoms together. Some elements even exist as a few atoms bind together. So they do exist differently. Okay, do exist differently. But again, all these are what? All these are what? Elements. Elements. Why? Because they only have what? One, one type. Okay, one type of atoms. But they do exist differently in nature. Okay, some exist as a one single atom. We call those monoatomic. Some exist as what? Two atoms together. We call those element diatomic. And these exist as multiple atoms. We call them polyatomic. Okay, with that, take a look at the periodic table. Okay, very important. Okay, very important. These three elements, phosphorus, sulfur, selenium, they exist as polyatomic elements in nature. Sulfur normally exists as S8. Okay, phosphorus, there's P4 and P8 as well. And selenium, there's selenium 8 as well. The yellow ones, okay, only what? Eight of them. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven? Sorry, seven of them. 
they exist as what? Dia talk. Dia talk means what? When you say hydrogen, if I have a balloon of hydrogen, we have a balloon of what? H2. Because that's how they exist. There's no hydrogen hanging around. Hydrogen is always what? Hydrogen 2. Oxygen is always what? O2. O2. Nitrogen is always N2. The other element, they all exist as what? Monoatomic. What does that mean? It means if I ask you to write the formula of that element, for example, copper, what's the formula? Cu. Iron, what's the formula? Fe. Cobalt, what's the formula? Co. Because they're what? Single. One single atom atoms. That's how you write the formula. But if I ask you to write the formula of this, okay, especially the yellow ones, please, please remember, write them as what? Diatomic. For example, if you say oxygen or fluorine in a reaction, you have to write a formula for fluorine. You need to write what? F2. You have to. If I say, hey, a mole of fluorine in a calculation, you need to write the formula as what? F2, that's very important. Sometimes if you put F, your calculation will be wrong. Remember these seven. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and what? Iodine. Okay, these four are all diatomic. Okay, diatomic. Okay, don't worry about these. These, we don't talk about them too much. Okay? And here this picture shows you This picture shows you the size, okay, the size of atoms, okay, or the size of some general, like a, objects, a, a period, <laughs> a period. Different people do it differently, right? But yeah, the, the bacteria, virus, antibody, glucose, the molecule, but you can see how, how small the, the atoms are. Okay, atoms are zero point, how many zeros? Four, nine zeros, one, four meters in diameter. Extremely small atoms. Extremely small. That gives us a very small topic here in this chapter. Okay, when you have a small number or big number, sometimes, okay, or like like the tennis ball is this one nanometer, but a big number or small number, how do we represent it in on paper in scientific literature in your textbook? Okay, we use scientific notation. Okay, scientific notation. Scientific notation is a number in this format. Contains two parts. One part is a number, non-zero number. It has start with a number with a single non-zero digit. That means from one through nine. You can have decimals, that's fine. But this number must be a single digit number. Single digit mean, means what? Cannot be 20, cannot be 11, cannot be 99. Has to be what? One through nine. Again, you can have decimal, but had this number has to be single digit. Does it make sense? Had, cannot be zero. Has to be one through nine. Then multiply 10 power by something. And this exponent must be a whole number, but could be positive or could be what? Negative. Be negative. Okay, that's why, that's how we use scientific numbers. Okay, and uh, this picture, oh, sorry, this slide show you how do you convert big number or small number into scientific notation? You move what? Decimal. Okay, decimal. Both big number, you move the decimal to the left. Where do you stop? Stop to where? To the right of the first non-zero digit, right? We remember we need a number with what? Non-zero digit. For small number, you move the decimal to where? To the right. Okay, to the right. And then stop where? Stop to the right of the first non-zero digit. If you move to the left, the exponent will be positive. If you move to the right, the exponent has to be what? Negative. Does this make sense? Okay, the reason I don't go over detail because you have a web assignment on scientific notation next week or something. Next or next week, I forgot. But you have a web assignment, so you have practice over there, so we don't spend too much time doing lecture. But I want to show you 
in your really, when you answer a question, if a big or small number, or even your calculator, okay, if you have your sign, if you, use, you have to buy a scientific calculator, it will give you scientific notations. Okay, and the automatic will give you scientific notations instead of a big or what or small numbers. All right, so. When atoms, okay, when atoms chemically bonded together, okay, chemical bonded in fixed combination, we get a monarchy. Okay, we get a monarchy. So, a formula of a monarchy, or a monarchy can be represented by using symbols of the elements, even simple step of the elements. And the resulting bigger, bigger symbols combined together in a fixed combination, we call that a formula. formula. A formula basically tells people what types of atoms or what types of atoms or elements you have in a monarchy. And it also tells people what are the numbers of each element you have in the monarchy. For example, the formula of water, H2O. Okay, you have seen this maybe a million times. This formula tells us two things. One is what? You have two types of atoms, or you have two elements. Hydrogen and what? Oxygen. And oxygen. Also, it tells what? These two elements, or these atoms in a one water rate ratio, Two to what? To one ratio. Or there, or in another way, in a better way, is is two hydrogen and one oxygen combined together to give you what? To give you a water molecule. That's called a fixed combination. A fixed combination or a fixed composition. And by the way, this is the model of a water molecule. But later on, we're going to study as well in chapter three why water is like this, like a bent V shape. But here again, even though we have seen this before, now we are systematically studying what is the formula? The formula is listing the element and also what? The number of what? Each atoms. Okay, each atoms. And by the way, I forgot here. These numbers, smaller ones, there's a one here, of course we don't rate, are called what? Are called subscripts. Okay, called subscripts. And that gives one thing I ask you to do. When you take quizzes and, uh, and exams, when you write a formula, make sure you put this number as what? Subscripts. Okay. You, your, your Blackboard answering box, kind of like a word. Okay. There's, a, there's, a, there's a function. When you, when, you, when you write something, for example, you write H2, you can highlight that 2 and then click the... There's a sign kind of like this, basically, right? Means what? You need to make, make this guy a what? A subscript. Just highlight it and click it. Okay, you, you will find it out. If not, bring your, your, your blackboard, I can show you. But please, because we're now in a chemistry class. Okay, you have to, when you write a formula, recognize. Okay, H2O is H subscript. Oh, not two as a, the same size. Okay, you can do that. I mean, it's very easy. On, your, on Blackboard, the, the, the editor has this function. Okay, has this function. Okay, next. Here are three uh, examples showing the formula in these three molecules. I ask you a quick question: Is can you tell me how many atoms are each elements are present, and how many atoms are total for each molecules are present? Okay, this one. We have how many sulfur? One. One. How many oxygen? Three. Three. So what? Total four atoms in sulfur trioxide. Very good. This one, hydrogen, two, two. sulfur, one. oxygen, four. so total seven. seven. Very good. This one, a little tricky. Iron, two, two. carbon, four. How many? How do you think? Three. Three. Why three? Because there's a three outside this parenthesis means what? Okay, we never study, but. 
it means free of what? Whatever the parentheses has. Okay, whatever inside the parentheses means free of this whole parentheses. So free of this whole thing means free of what? Carbon. How many oxygen do you think? Nine. Nine. Because three of what? O3. So it's what? It's nine. So total is what? How many? 14. 14. 14. Okay, total 14 atoms in this form. Very good. Okay, again, uh, we'll, we'll see this more, don't worry. But if you have multiple of these things, the three outside the parentheses means three of what? Whatever inside the parentheses. Okay, this is called iron three carbonate. Okay, next, after we study these compounds, we're going to learn how to name these compounds. Okay, name this compounds. Now, in this chapter, okay, in this chapter, except a few, maybe a one or two examples, you guys notice already, all these compounds we studied in this chapter, this chapter, or most of the compounds we studied here, for example, carbon monoxide, right? Carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen trioxide, water, they have how many elements? In the formula, two, right? Sulfur, oxygen, carbon, oxygen, water, which is what? Hydrogen, what? And oxygen, right? Most of the compound we study in this chapter has how many elements? Two elements. And both of these elements are actually what? Non metals. Do you guys notice that? Let me go back to the periodic table. This is the metal, non metal uh, periodic table. You see that? Carbon is here, right? Nitrogen, oxygen, right? Sulfur, phosphorus. All, most of the compounds we study are what? Made by these elements. So that's very important information because, because this rule of naming, we're naming these compounds now, only apply for the compound I just summarized. What are they? A combination of how many? Two non-metals. Okay, this is what we are studying now. Because in later chapter, we have another different rule okay, to, to name these compounds. But compound we study in this chapter, most of them are satisfying this condition. What is condition again? Combination of what? Two non-metals. Okay, I put in red and bold. That means, guys, very important. We call these compounds, okay, we call these compounds binary covalent compounds. Okay, binary covalent compound. What does binary mean? Binary means what? Two elements. Covalent means what? Two nonmetals. Okay, we'll explain here why it's called covalent in later chapters. So these compounds are called binary covalent compounds. And the rules only apply for these compounds. So what is the rule? If we have a compound like this, how do we name those? We name the first element by the name, just whatever the name is, read the name. The second element, you change the name to a base name plus I-D-E, pronounces I-D. Okay, you change the name of the second element to a base name plus I-D. Then add prefixes in front of each name. The prefix indicate what? The subscript of each. For example, here, N2O4. The first name is what? Nitrogen. Second name is what? Oxygen. But I change to a stem name, OX, followed by ID. So oxygen becomes what? Oxide. Then I add prefixes, indicate the subscript of each. What's the subscript for nitrogen? Two. So nitrogen becomes di. What's the subscript for oxygen? Four. four. So uh, sub prefix for oxygen is what? Tetra. tetra. So the full name is dinitrogen tetroxide. Tetroxide. The only thing you want to know is what is the how do we change base name? Here. Bromo becomes what? Bromide. Right? You're gonna add ID here. Fluorine chloro becomes Chloride, fluorine, fluoride, iodine, 
iodide, nitrogen, nitride, oxygen, oxide, phosphorus, phosphite, sulfur, sulfite. See that? Easy, right? And next, of course, is what? Is the prefixes. Okay, these are the prefixes. One for di, uh, for mono, two for what? Di and tri is for three, tetra is for four, and five is for pentad. Okay, give you guys a few minutes to take a look at these things. Okay, when you get home, I, I strongly recommend you to cover it. And then what? Then practice by yourself. Okay. There are many examples I can find. Right? Remember how many nanometers we're looking at. Nanometers only is what? That corner of the periodic table, right? So they, when they combine each other, there are many compounds we're talking about. So that's why if you practice this and make sure you're good at all the compounds we talk about in this whole chapter, you, 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 you don't have to worry about naming any binary COVID and compound anymore. You pass that. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You always name it right. The only thing you need to know is what? Look at the compound. Does it contain what? Two non-metals. That's the most important thing. Not the rules. The rules are easy, right, guys? You don't need to memorize the rules. You name them, you get used to it. Does every, everything make sense? Okay, one thing. I don't know if you noted that. If model is at the beginning of the name, we don't use it. For example, you see that? The, the prefix for this C is what? One, right? There should be a model in there. But you, do you see a model? No. That's an exception. An exception. The same here, phosphorus. Do you see that? What's the subscript for phosphorus? One. So there should be a model, right? Model is trouble. But do you see a model? No. So model, when in front of a name, we do not use it. That's a very important exception. Otherwise, there are no exceptions. See, there's no model here. Iodine, iodine, hepta phosphorus. And here at the bottom is show you some, some uh, uh, kind of like a grammar thing. Okay. When the prefix ends with A or O and element begin with A or O, the final vowel of the prefix is dropped. Okay, for example, what? Uh, tetraoxide here. Tetraoxide, right? Tetra, the A of the prefix is dropped because the element starts with what? Start with O. Does it make sense? Okay. Again, that's a grammar. If you keep the A, it won't be a big mistake. But if you keep the model here, that's a mistake. Okay, this is just a grammar. You don't keep it. Right? Next, quick practice, guys. Which of the name is not correct? Based on what we learned. Which of the B. name is not correct? B. B. Then what is the correct name? Would be diphosphorus pentoxide. Say again? Diphosphorus pentoxide. Diphosphorus pentoxide. Very good. Okay, diphosphorus pentoxide. When you, when you search online, actually some, some websites give this name, right? Again, that's why I'm talking about in this class, always use the rule to name compound. Do not search the name on compound because sometimes the web won't give you a different name which is not what we taught in class. This is diphosphatox. And the same, there's a grammar, you can say penta, the A is dropped because oxygen start with what? Start with O. Okay, diphosphorus pentoxide, that's the correct name. Another exception is some molecules. Okay, some molecules like these. Again, all these molecules, what's, what's in common? They are made by two what? Nonmetals, right? And they have common name, accepted by the whole Society by the whole chemistry field. So people use their common name as their systematic name. They don't name them anymore. They just use their common name. Here, let's take a list a few of those common names. Okay, for example, nobody called this dinitrogen monoxide, right? We call it what? Water. Okay, when we call this hydrogen peroxide. We call this ammonia. We call this uh, uh, hydrazine. We call this methane, ethane, nit nitrous oxide, and nitric oxide. These are some exceptions as well. Uh, the oxides, you can still name those, but those, I don't see any people name those. Okay, I don't even know how to name those, to be honest. Okay, I've never named those for the first four. The second and, and the fifth one, the sixth, fifth one, they have their organic names. They're different. The nitrogen ones, 
I do see sometimes we name them systematically. But again, my point is some molecules have common names. Okay, you're gonna use their common names instead of naming. Next, okay, next. We studied matter, classification, formula, periodic table, we study many. Next, let's take a look. Matters can change. And when matter changes, there are two types of changes as well. One type of change is called physical change. Another type of change is called chemical change. What's the difference? The difference is whether the change results in new substance. Or in another word, whether the change changes the chemical composition. Right? New substance means what? Composition change. If there's no new substance, means composition what? Did not change. So whatever you understand it. If the chemical composition did not change, we call the change what? Physical change. If the chemical change, if the changes, if the changes change the chemical composition, means you get new substances, we call the change what? Chemical change. Does it make sense? Okay, whether you're getting new substances. Okay, whether you change the chemical composition. If it is chemical. If not, what? Physical. Okay? And after you understand those, take a look at these few changes. Can you tell me each one, do you think it is whether chemical or physical change? The first one, burning a match. Is that physical or chemical change? Chemical. Chemical change. Why? Uh, because you're... You're changing. changing what? The chemical composition. Match mm -hmm. is what? The match head is some, some fuel, right? Some... some ignite and they become something else and when you burn the match the wood becomes what ashes and some residues here it's chemical change good baking a cake physical change baking a cake is That's physical change chemical change. Chemical, change. chemical change right and the whole thing is the, 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 the maybe the, the sugar becomes brown right it becomes caramel and the, the, the powder is from raw to 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 to, to bake it's definitely chemical change cracking a piece of glass Physical change, very good. A piece of apple darkened? Chemical. Chemical change, because the darkened part is definitely no longer the same apple. Okay, boiling water? Physical. Physical change. Rusting of iron? Chemical. Chemical change, good. Again, when you have new substances generated, okay, later on you have some experiments helping you better understand these two is Normally, okay, normally, they will be accompanied by color change, some gas, some fire, some heat, etc. Those changes are chemical change. Okay, what are mostly physical changes? Physical changes are either division, such as a cut of paper in half, break some glasses, or change of state. What is change of state? What is state? Solid, liquid, and what gas? Change of state means what? From liquid to solid, from solid to liquid, from liquid to gas, from gas to liquid. These are normally the physical changes. Change of state and what? Division. Others, mostly chemical. Okay? Another quick concept check. Which of the following is an example of chemical change? Burning of, Burning of what? Wood. Okay, and by the fact, again, that's why I don't know if you guys are taking notes or not. Almost all burning are chemical changes. Okay, what is burning? Some fuel reacts with what? With oxygen. Okay, you see fire, you see heat, energy is released. That's definitely signs of chemical change. You know there are new substances there. Okay, the other ones are all physical changes. Okay, next, okay, next, I will. I will give you an introduction here, and we can stop what are we today. I think we're very much on schedule. Okay, next is, of course, when we're talking about chemistry, we focus more on what? On chemical change. Okay, chemical change. 
So how do we represent a chemical change? We use a chemistry language called a chemical equation. A chemical equation. Chemical equation is basically something in chemistry language to describe a what? Chemical change. What is chemical change? Change of composition, generating of what? New substances. Before generating new substance, so we have something what? Before and what? After. Old and new. And in order to tell people the old and new before and after, we use an arrow to separate it. Anything before the arrow, we call those reactants. Anything after on the right side of the arrow, we call them what? Products. Okay, products. The most important fact about chemical change is Chemical changes, even though they are generating new substances, change the chemical composition. But it is happening by rearrangement of atoms. Rearrangement of atoms. Think about something I mentioned earlier before. Atom is the smallest what? Building blocks, right? like Lego pieces. During chemistry, if we're still talking about chemistry, I said atoms, the identity, what? Don't change. Is that right? So if the identity don't change, what happens? If we want to get something new, we what? We re-what? Arrange. Is that right? Think about if you have a Lego toy. If I make something new, what would you do? You need to break it apart, what? Make a new ones, right? I said the piece themselves don't change because they're atoms. So in order to make a new oil, you need to break it down and what? Build something new. And same idea, this is what happens in chemistry. Before and after, the atoms themselves never changes. The only what? Ray arrange. Take a look at this equation. Sulfur. You see sulfur here? Sulfur before is binding with what? Calcium. Now sulfur is binding with what? Hydrogen. Calcium is now binding with what? Oxygen. Oxygen before is binding with what? Hydrogen. You see that? Atoms never changed. They only what? Rearranged. They rearranged. And because of that, all chemical equation, all chemical equation will follow the law of conservation of mass. And what does conservation mean? What does conservation mean? It can't be destroyed means the same, right? means conserve, you mean the same. Think, you think about the Lego. You break it apart, you make something new, but you have to use still all the Lego pieces. That means before and after, if you weigh it, will be the same what? Same weight, is that right? No matter what you build. If you use the same Lego toys, pieces to build a different toy, if possible, okay? Then you end up with the same weight. No matter how you build it, you're gonna use all of them all. The same, that's why it's called law of conservation of mass. That means what, before and after, you simply rearrange the things, but all things are still there, right? They have the same what? Same mass. Okay, same mass. Two examples. One is the combustion of charcoal, which is mainly carbon. Okay, carbon. Reacting with oxygen to give you carbon dioxide. You see that? We see the rearrangement of atoms. Carbon by itself is an element. Oxygen by itself element. But after the reaction, what, what happened? Oxygen binding with what? With that carbon to give you carbon what? Dioxide. Re rearranged. But you still have what? One carbon and what? Two oxygen. Okay, very good. Next. Okay, next. Sulfur. React with the oxygen. We have sulfur dioxide. Sulfur is now rearranged to combine with what? With those two oxygen. But sulfur is still there, oxygen is what? It's still, still there. Okay, one thing about the language is, you can notice here already, sometimes we use lowercase letters, most italic lowercase letters, in a parenthesis to indicate the state of the reactants and the products. Not all the time. Okay, depends if needed. Most of them we actually don't. Okay, for example, here S stands for sulfur is a what? Solid. 
Here G stands for oxygen is a gas. Here G, sulfur dioxide is what? Is a gas. Again, lowercase italic in a parenthesis. Okay, that's why this S will never confuse with that S because this is what? Element is always capitalized. This one is always what? Lowercase and also in a parenthesis. Okay, in a parenthesis. And again, okay, and again, if a reaction satisfy what we talk about, the law of conservation of mass, we call the reaction balanced. Okay, balanced. A chemical equation must be balanced. Otherwise, it's not correct. Why? Because all chemical equations should what? Follow the law of conservation of mass. Okay, these two are what? Balanced. Why? Because it follows what? Law of conservation of mass. One carbon, one carbon. Two oxygen, two oxygen. One sulfur, one sulfur. Two oxygen and what? Two oxygen. These two reactions are balanced. And all chemical reactions must be balanced. Does that make sense now? Again, why? Because chemical equation, again, is what? Rearrangement of atoms. Make sense? Okay, we'll stop here. I think we can stop early today and uh, next Tuesday we're going to continue talking about what if an equation you write or you see is not balanced, does not satisfy the law of conservation, what should we do to make it what? Balanced. Make sense? Again, you guys have something due on Monday afternoon, all right? And, uh, let me know if you need help or you feel free to email me anything. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.